Dear colleagues, welcome to today's EICVI webinar on contrast echocardiography in daily routine practice. I'm your host for this webinar. My name is Dr. Helfen from the St. Marien Hospital in Lünen, Germany. I have with me here Professor Dr. Shivaka from the Adverb uh, University Hospital in Belgium and Assistant Professor Dr. Ageli from the Hippocration Hospital of Athens. Uh, the aim of this webinar is to give you a better understanding of when to use contrast agents in the Ecolab, how to optimize contrast enhanced images, how to implement contrast agents in different stress protocols, and how to assess wall motion together with myocardial perfusion during stress tests. To illustrate this, both speakers have prepared multiple case presentations. At the end of this 60 minutes live event, you will be updated about the newest recommendations of the clinical practice of contrast echocardiography published by the EICVI in October 2017. For the best learning experience, we also invite you to participate in online assessment sessions in the form of multiple choice questions that will be submitted during the presentations. This session is interactive and we encourage you to participate by sending your questions of, or your comments at any time during the webinar through the chat. Anything you need to know, just ask and we will provide tips for your clinical practice. This webinar is possible thanks to the educational grant from Braco Imaging Milan. Now I will hand over to Professor Schwalka, who will start this session. Please. Thank you, Dr. Helfen, for this um, introduction. Hello, everyone. And um, let's get to the presentation, so I have no disclosures. And actually, I'd like to start this session uh, with a question to the audience to see um, the level of experience of our audience for the use of contrast. So I have a few questions. Uh, the first four uh, are dealing with not, being, not using contrast in their echo labs, and the reasons being that harmonic imaging of the present-day echo machines is good enough. Uh, the patients are echogenic, they don't have a problem with obesity in their country. The second is that there's no reimbursement in, uh, in their country. The third is that there's no formal training that they've had and so they don't know how to use it. The fourth is that all um, echocardiographers are uh, well trained and they don't need echo contrast. And the fifth possibility is that the audience uses echo contrast on a regular basis um, in rest studies and also stress. So, um, let's see um, what the audience have to say. Yes, um, so uh, while our colleagues are voting, uh, how is the situation in Belgium? Is there any reimbursement for contrast studies? Yes, I'm, I'm very happy to say that contrast is reimbursed for LVO. Yeah. Sadly enough, not for perfusion, so we're waiting for that, but for LVO it's reimbursed. Okay. So uh, we have uh, the, the answers from the audience and the majority of our colleagues uh, goes with answer three, don't use it, no formal training for use of contrast. Would you like to comment this? Well, um, I hope <laughs> that this webinar is going to encourage them to uh, start <coughs> using contrast because it really is not that difficult, certainly for the use of LVO. Okay. So uh, let's go ahead. Um, I'd like to start with this paper. This is an ESCVI appropriateness criteria for the use of transthoracic echo in adults. Um, the paper actually presents certain clinical scenarios where echo is appropriate, but it also stresses that, um, that the test is actually operator and patient dependent, and that the test should actually be performed by someone who's very well qualified to perform the test and is able to provide with high quality and reliable images. But on top of that, that the test should actually have added value for the patient and for the health uh, care system on top of the medical history and the clinical examination. So uh, this is quite clear what the transthoracic echo should uh, give us, provide us. Um, the first um, scenario is an acute emergency setting and the recommendations are that the focus should be on the assessment of left ventricular size and function. The second scenario, the, the, the table provides several scenarios, is a non-urgent um, situation for assessment of the patient 
And once again, you have the assessment. The focus should be on the assessment of left ventricular size and function. The third scenario, which is a chronic situation where repeated echoes are done, as in heart failure patients, for example, once again, the focus should be on left ventricular size and function. Now, this is where the application of contrast uh, echocardiography comes in. Now, there's a plethora of evidence that contrast, application of contrast, improves the definition of endocardial, uh, left ventricular endocardial border, and we can assess the LV structure, volumes, uh, and ejection fraction accurately, and it's also possible to assess wall motion, um, to assess the wall motion. And uh, this has been so convincing that the ESCVI and the American Society of Echocardiography actually recommend the use of contrast when two or more contiguous segments are poorly visible. And the use of contrast in such a scenario has actually received a class one level of um, 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 A indication. And um, this has also led to reimbursement in certain countries. As uh, I said earlier on, in Belgium, we enjoy that reimbursement. Um, and we're very happy about that. The second uh, indication is the assessment of myocardial perfusion. However, my talk will concentrate on the uh, improved delineation of endocardial border. Now, this paper is really hot from the press, uh, which is a recommendation paper from the ESCVI on the clinical practice uh, of uh, contrast echocardiography. And I actually encourage the re um, the, um, our viewers to read this paper because it provides really the required background, evidence, protocols, and also tips and tricks to perform contrast echo in the regular clinical setting. And hopefully it will ease any sort of reservations that our audience might have um, to use um, echo contrast in their routine practice. However, the paper also stresses that despite the availability and despite the plethora of evidence for its, uh, its usefulness, the use of contrast echo uh, at rest cardiography is very low, very poor. And although the yield is somewhat more, somewhat higher in stress echocardiography, um, it is still not used as often as it ought to be. And it is thought that um, there is evidence that 10 to 15 percent of patients in regular stress, regular resting conditions could benefit from the use of contrast, and anything above from uh, 33 percent um, in a stress setting. So these are the um, available contrast uh, agents. Presently, they're second generation contrast agents. All of them, uh, what they have in common is a, uh, a core of a high molecular weight inert gas, and they have a mono um, uh, shell, uh, a shell monolayer outside. Now the bubbles, micro bubbles, have special acoustic uh, characteristics. So when um, they are put in, in, um, in an ultrasound beam, in, a, in an ultrasound field, they start to resonate. And they um, compress on um, positive pressure and expand on a negative pressure. And they have a nonlinear behavior. And this, this property has been exploited in contrast echocardiography. Um, the, um, the, the bubbles actually uh, generate very strong harmonic components. And in fact, there is a very strong backscatter index compared to red blood cells and normal myocardial tissue. Now, to be able to use contrast in the clinical setting, you need uh, contrast-specific imaging modalities. And um, these modalities are actually also very vendor-specific. So you, know, you might see different terms like pulse inversion, amplitude modulation, etc. And uh, this is just what the vendor uses in their particular setup to be able to exploit those special properties of the contrast. <coughs> so important to realize is the mechanical index in which the contrast bubbles are used. So high mechanical index, uh, what we normally scan at, 1.4, for example, that would destroy the bubbles. And so we would work in a, in a setting of intermittent to low mechanical index, or so anything below 0 0.5. And um, we have these four main techniques. As I said, this is vendor specific. And normally, your echo machine should have that um, installed on it. Now, in our lab, we use Sonoview. Uh, and this is Luke, um, one of our nurses, who has actually extensive experience in the preparation of contrast. And some of you comes in such a kit, and you've got several components in that. You have a glass vial first with um, lyophilized powder, 25 milligrams of that. And then you have also 5 milliliters of saline, which is provided in the kit. And you have to inject that um, with, by a special system into the uh, glass vial 
shake the vial vigorously for 20 seconds and we're ready, you get a milky suspension and we're ready to give a bolus of uh, the contrast. Down here what you see is a special pump also devised by Braco. Um, for infusion purposes and it's a special pump because um, it actually mixes the bubbles and injects at the same time and this is usually used uh, in settings where you want to do uh, the perfusion where you need in fact an infusion. Now this is an old cartoon but it demonstrates very well how the bubbles enter um, the right heart and then traverse the pulmonary circulation and enter the left heart and uh, to provide us very nicely with the left ventricular pacification. And after a while, the, the gas simply dissolves in the blood and is simply exhaled out of the body. So it's a very fast procedure and within 15 to 20 minutes, the gas bubbles are completely out of our system. Now regarding the bolus technique, I'd like to say something here. We would give about 0.5 to 1 milliliters as a shot bolus, followed by 5 milliliters of uh, saline uh, flush. And the saline flush should be given uh, very slowly, ideally 10 to even 20 seconds. Um, and then for, uh, if you want to give an infusion, then that would be at 0.8 to 1 milliliter. Um, and then the, the rate adjusted according to um, what you see on your screen. Okay, so this brings me to um, the use of um, contrast for imaging benefits in certain clinical scenarios. So as we, we talked about it, the left ventricular volume and function, structure and masses, and regional uh, wall motion assessment. And there will also be some slides on troubleshooting. So it brings me to the first case. Um, this is a 40-year-old male with recurrent chest pain episodes. And the man was very anxious because he has a very strong history, family history of premature coronary artery disease with several people simply dropping dead at a young age. The ECG was normal, so he comes to our lab and um, this is the resting uh, echo image and we weren't quite sure if there was a warm motion abnormality in the apex. So he got a shot of uh, contrast and this was at a mechanical index of 0 0.3, which was actually the setting on the machine. We can uh, discuss uh, one or two questions uh, from the audience. Um, uh, there is uh, the question um, about different uh, vendors of contrast agents. Um, is there any difference? Can you use every contrast agent uh, for perfusion, for example? This is one of the questions here. What do you think? Oh, um, well, each um, bubble has slightly different characteristics. They're all second generation bubbles. Um, you know, the, the core as well as the shell offer slightly different um, characteristics, but ideally they can all be used for um, LVO, left ventricular yeah. pacification, as well as perfusion. So, right, we've got our, okay. we've got our stuff back here. Okay, so, you know, he, the patient got a shot of contrast and at the mechanical index of 0 0.3, you can see that there's swirling motion in the apex and this is, um, the bubbles seem to be destroyed there. So we reduce the mechanical index to 0 0.2 and uh, we see that the apex is filling up much nicely and um, actually, you know, the wall motion isn't so bad. If you would reduce the mechanical index even further to 0.1, um, the delineation of the endocardium is a, is a lot less and so um, ideally um, zero mechanical index of 0 0.2 uh, would suit us the best here. Then, um, this is also an interesting case. So it's a young male, 16 year old chap actually who's, who, did, who had recurrent syncopies and arrhythmias and he was, uh, he was uh, admitted to the cardiac ICU and um, you know, for a young chap, the, the function isn't really that normal. It does the heart is not that enthusiastic. So we weren't sure if there was an apical um, thrombus or false tendons. Uh, wasn't quite sure if there was an, a non-compaction. And so we gave contrast. And this is, um, you know, I must admit, it's not the best of echo st uh, contrast studies. But we had, the, we had our diagnosis there. Uh, there was no apical uh, thrombus and there was no non-compaction. So again, as I said, this is in an ICU setting. Um, this is an interesting case just from last week, actually, a 69-year-old female who was receiving um, chemotherapy for a GI tumor. And um, the oncology center to determine the ejection fraction, this is 2D Simpson's method, 
38%. And I got a telephone call from him saying, oh, wow, um, is this really true? I mean, this is a significant drop from the ejection fraction of 51%. Uh, that was just noted 10 days ago. And so we did a contrast study on her. Uh, we called her back after a few hours. And um, I hope you will agree that the ejection fraction is actually much better. And when we did a 2D Simpsons, it was, um, um, there we go. Um, well, it was 48%. OK. Right. Um, so, you know, we have, as I said, a plethora of uh, data on um, use of contrast uh, for endocardial border delineation. And this was a very interesting multicenter study, which looked at the determination of volumes and uh, function, where they used actually 2D and 3D echoes, non-contrast and contrast enhanced. And they compared it to MRI as a gold standard. They also used uh, biplanes in the ventriculography. And here you see the agreement between um, um, the, um, uh, the, um, between the uh, various uh, readers. And you see that the agreement actually improved greatly after administration of contrast and was very similar to MRI when you look at the volumes as well as the ejection fraction. And again, the correlation was much better in 2D as well as 3D after administration of contrast. Um, the next case, um, this was actually two indications in one, one patient. So the patient um, ischemic cardiomyopathy and uh, the referring cardiologist said, uh, was, was thinking about an ICD, but there was also a problem, was there an apical thrombus? So, you know, we did, uh, we decreased the depth and put a bit of color on there, what we would have done classically to, to see if there was a thrombus or not. And we weren't, we couldn't quite, um, we couldn't quite also exclude the thrombus. Also with the multiplane uh, technique, we weren't quite sure. We gave a shot of contrast and we were able to get the ejection fraction as well as exclude uh, the possibility of an apical thrombus. And again, you have the uh, biplane technique there as well, which actually excluded the, the thrombus. And another patient, is there an apical thrombus? So you see an apical warm motion abnormality. And um, in this case, there really was a thrombus. So you see that dark structure over there, uh, which is an a thrombus is a vascular uh, structure. And so it doesn't fill up with contrast and it appears dark. And at the same time, you also see uh, the warm motion abnormality and actually also perfusion defect. So this is a, a flash replenishment technique that we use for perfusion. And this is obtaining a lot of information just in one study. Um, tumors can also be assessed with contrast. And um, tumors are vascular structures. And so here you see this was a patient, a young man with the small cell bronchus uh, carcinoma. And he had right heart metastasis. And you see that the, the mass here fills up just like the heart muscle. And so it is thought, and this is a very nice paper illustrating that, that in a regular clinical scenario in non-contrast studies, up to 50% of the uh, uh, thrombi are missed. And that the yield is increased greatly, well above 90% after the use of contrast. So this is very encouraging and a definite indication for the use of contrast. Um, this is an interesting case, a 56-year-old chap uh, without any chest pain complaints, but he was sent uh, to us by one of my EP colleagues and with the question of, is there apical hypertrophy? So, you know, the 2D images don't really uh, prove that. And we gave contrast. Um, there's attenuation here, basal, but, well, we couldn't quite figure out from the uh, four-chamber view. But when we gave the, uh, when we looked at the biplane images, it was very, very obvious that this is indeed apical hypertrophy. And that was the reason why he'd send the patient to us, you know, with this typical uh, ECG of apical hypertrophy. Okay, so this brings me really to the um, um, stress echoes, assessment of regional wall motion. I was a 65-year-old man, an obese man with type 2 diabetes since um, 35 years. He presented himself at our emergency department, and the ECG and the troponins were negative. And um, this was his um, uh, resting, uh, these are his resting echo images. These are triplane images uh, from a GE system. We also do, uh, we also had 2D uh, images, but they were terribly foreshortened. So I'd like to, um, I'd like the audience to look at these images very carefully because I've got a question coming up soon. So, um, so we've got the four chamber, two chamber, and the three chamber. And my question is, 
Um, is this normal wall motion? Was there a wall motion abnormality in the apex? Was there a wall motion abnormality in the anterior wall as well as apex? Or is the wall motion abnormality compatible with three vessel disease? So um, please vote. Yes, <coughs> while uh, voting we may discuss, um, you have used uh, simultaneous triplane acquisition. Is this your clinical routine or do you uh, use more often 2D uh, for this question? Oh, we, use, we do 2D stress echo in all mm. patients, but simultaneously yes. we also employ mm. the 3D acquisition just to aid us in conditions where we, we, wouldn't, we would have terrible foreshortening, etc. Okay, so uh, we have gotten the answers. Um, the majority of our visitors uh, go with answer three, wall motion abnormality, anterior and apex. Do okay. you agree? 49%? Okay, let's see. So here's the, the resting non-contrast images, and you've got the uh, resting contrast images, and indeed, so you've got the apical wall motion abnormality. It's, it's extending further to the anterior wall. And at peak stress, um, Oh, the apex is definitely not good there. And, and you see that uh, there is extensive dyskinesis in the apical region, and this uh, certainly extends further on to the anterior wall. And the cath actually showed that there was a tight lesion in the proximal LAD, so the patient received um, a stent. Um, then going on to the next thing, um, slide, this is multicenter data, looking at the agreement, the kappa value of non-contrast and contrast images versus MRI, and you see that the contrast, these are the 2D contrast images, have a very similar kappa value to the MRI. So this is, this is encouraging stuff. Uh, some more data, old data, looking at the uh, specificity, sensitivity, and accuracy of contrast enhanced images compared to MRI and cineventriculography. This is 2D data and again very promising results uh, there as well. This is an interesting study. Let's take a moment to look at that. Uh, intermediate degree of stenosis and looking at the, the value of contrast enhanced stress echo uh, in these patients. Um, and the yield of contrast enhanced is much, much better compared to the non-contrast enhanced. And this was compared to FFR measurements in these patients. What about the clinic clinical impact? Um, an interesting study here, almost 700 patients from all aspects um, of uh, patients, so outpatients, um, the medical ICU, um, surgical ICU, and hospitalized patients. And these were the patients who had low echo imaging. So uh, each column shows the blue with the adequate imaging, red is inadequate imaging. And uh, yellow are really uh, that you cannot assess them at all. After giving contrast, there were no patients who couldn't be assessed, and most of them were adequate imaging. But importantly, uh, there was a clear um, uh, clinical impact on these patients um, who did receive the contrast in the sense that the light blue um, parts of the bar show that there was no uh, change in the medical management, but the rest down here shows everything that was adapted, adjusted after the use of contrast, meaning that the procedures downstream and uh, medical or extra tests were reduced, create, giving a clear, um, imp clear uh, improvement or clear cost effectiveness. Now this is an, these are two our old slides just to illustrate apical hypertrophy. Indeed, it was diagnosed as apical hypertrophy, but you see this is at a mechanical index of 1.6. So you see a lot of swirling of contrast and contrast destruction. So important to uh, adjust your mechanical index. Again, this is a slide that we've seen uh, before where uh, the mechanical index was 0 0.3 and we'd adjusted the uh, mechanical index to give us um, a better delineation of the apex. This patient here, you've got a lot of um, uh, echo, too, too much contrast. So here you have to uh, attenuation down here. You have to wait a little bit longer uh, for the attenuation to, um, to disappear. Again, here you have attenuation and the blooming uh, problem here. So there's too much contrast here. So either you reduce your rate of infusion or you wait for 10 to 20 seconds sometimes so that the contrast uh, is reduced so you have really clear images. And this uh, last slide here uh, showing a lot of swirling of contrast in a dilated ventricle. So the point here would be to um, increase the um, contrast rate and to give more contrast. <coughs> the risks. Um, very low risk, actually, um, 
you know, low risk, also significant reactions. Um, an important slide, I'm coming to the end of my presentation, but regarding the training, it's important to follow a course to learn the performance interpretation and the pitfalls and the uh, side effects or the contrast. For LVO, 25 supervised uh, studies should be done. Uh, and to keep your competency, 50 per year should be done. And for uh, stress echoes, for LVO, and for perfusion, 50 to 100 supervised studies in a high volume center, and ideally um, verification with uh, um, angiography. Now checklist for contrast echo, this is in the paper, I will skip over that, and some uh, protocols. Um, I would really encourage our um, audience to read that paper and you will find all sorts of tips and tricks in there. And so my final question to the audience would be, which of the following are true? So uh, for left ventricle structure assessment, use an intermediate MI, so less than 0 0.5 uh, uh, MI for the scanning. For perfusion, use low MI, less than 2 point, 0.2. For function and perfusion, lose low, use low MI and high frame rate of more than 25 hertz. And low MI scanning um, and less contrast is actually preferred. And so this is class uh, one level B indication. And the fifth possibility is all of the above. So please start voting. So uh, meanwhile, um, uh, why, why do you believe it may be helpful to use an intermediate MI for the diagnosis of LV structure abnormalities? Yeah, you know, so hmm. when you look at, when you want to look at LV structure, so you, you might be thinking about smaller thrombi or, or, or um, trabeculations as in non-compaction. And at low MI, these structures may not really reflect enough. And so you would actually miss them. So you mm -hmm. want to have um, intermediate MI to be able to also perceive them, to be able to see them. Yeah, thank you. So uh, we have a very experienced uh, audience. 65% uh, uh, voted for, 67% uh, for all of the above. Oh, wonderful. Fantastic. I think you agree. We have really uh, lots of uh, very, very interesting questions from the audience. Uh, it is hard to pick some uh, of these. Um, a few questions are about uh, the diagnostic value, especially in the operation area. Uh, there is, for example, an, a question, what is about the use of uh, contrast uh, um, after cardiac surgery? What do you, uh, uh, I think, uh, on the surgical ICU? Uh, yeah. Do you see uh, an indication there? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, we should be using more of that because uh, that paper that I showed, it's, uh, it's from several years ago, but this was very obvious that, uh, you know, contrast is very beneficial there. And, you know, it's, it's not just being able to, um, to just look at the ventricle and get your diagnosis, but they clearly showed a cost effectiveness there, that there, were, there was an, a, a, several savings in downstream tests performed and actually also the medical management. So this should be... Mm -hmm. uh, Definitely mm, I, I think um, in the situation um, to look at perfusion will be helpful. For example, the question is uh, a venous bypass graft occluded. Uh, this will be helpful. Yeah, of course. We can do uh, stress echo studies, uh, evaluating blood mm -hmm. motion, perfusion abnormalities, and of course we can uh, uh, perform CFR to see the LAD mm -hmm. or LIMA. Very, use uh, very useful information. Yeah, there is oh, another, que I think we have uh, time for another question. Um, what is the rule of uh, cardiac contrast echo in uh, patients after cardiac valve surgery? Do you see there any, um, what, what do you think? After cardiac valve surgery? Mm -hmm. um, um, do you see there? Just to uh, evaluate the left ventricle. Mm. For right example, paravalvular legs? Yeah. Uh, is it yeah. helpful? Not to for your paravalvular. Not for paravalvular. I wouldn't because uh, but we haven't really used it no, for no, paravalvular no. leaks yeah. or anything like that. But uh, uh, to, to diagnose uh, an acute dissection, maybe uh, after of TAVI? Course. Of that, course, that that, is, that would be useful. I think yeah. The paravalvular leaks. I think the whole thing would fill up with contrast, mm -hmm. and you wouldn't be able to differentiate. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah. I think w uh, one question maybe, we have uh, lots of questions to, to safety concerns. Uh, 
Yeah, that's um, an in interesting thing to um, uh, to to approach uh, or to look yeah, at. Uh, so you are both very very experienced. Have performed. Uh, maybe thousands of yes. contrast studies. One question is here, have you personally ever seen an allergic contrast reaction? Yeah. Maybe, yeah. maybe? We have seen some uh, simple uh, allergic reaction, but no concern. It's a... Uh, no, 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 deaths, no, uh, no, no, okay. no and, other reaction. And yeah. in your Ecolab? Oh, oh, well, my Ecolab, yes, but me personally, I, I've indeed mm. done near to 2000, I would say, contrast studies. Um, I've ne actually never seen them. I've been fortunate in that. But one of my um, younger colleagues, when she started to use contrast um, very early in her <laughs> developing, building up her experience, actually, she experienced um, indeed an allergic reaction and one that was thought to be mm -hmm. almost like anaphylaxis, which we are not quite sure if it was really anaphylaxis, but because we really got there very yeah. quickly and treated it as, as so, such. So it happens. It does happen, but you know. You but you should be. Uh, prepared. Right, right. You and that is also one of the stipulations. Uh, yeah. A medication on hand to, uh, um, uh, in an emergency case, right. inject uh, uh, an anti allergic medication. Right, right. And this is one of the, you know, the, the points uh, to checkpoints that, that I just skipped over yeah. in the interest of time. But um, that's also given very nicely in the ESCVI paper, and you know one should really read that and follow those steps. And one of those stipulations are indeed that you know people uh, who are dealing with contrast, they should also know what the possible side effects would be, and should also know how to deal with that. Yeah, I think so. So um, then I will hand over to Professor Ageli from the Hippocrition yeah. Hospital in Essex. Uh, and uh, okay. please. Thank you, Dr. Heffen, for this kind invitation. So it's quite revealing that the use of contrast enhanced ultrasound have changed the face of the Ecolab. Ecolab is a hemodynamic lab. And furthermore, we know that the stress echo studies have several advantages. They are bedside portable at non-ionizing techniques. And furthermore, the use of enhanced cardiac culture sound increased diagnostic confidence, decreased misdiagnosis, improved patient management, decreased need for additional tests, of course, increased cost effectiveness. So our purpose today is to do a short introduction an historical overview of our clinical practice and, of course, recent cases for demonstrating and voting. So, uh, the last decade, several recommendations, consensus, and finally, guidelines for the cardiac sonographer in the performance of contrast echocardiography have been published. According to 2013 ESC guidelines on stable adina, you see that the myocardial contrast echocardiography assess both wall motion and perfusion abnormalities during stress echo. Concerning uh, recent recommendations by ESCVI 2017, again, the use of contrast echocardiography has now extended beyond cardiac structure and function of assessment to evaluation of perfusion, both of the myocardium and of the intracardial structure. Contrast enhanced echo is like a navigator of blood flow into the cardiac, into the cardiac cavities. Mm -hmm. But furthermore, you see, uh, we see the, how uh, the microbubbles circulate into the myocardium in this patient with uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and of course, in rare case, cases, into the pericardium. This is a case with aortic dissection into the uh, pericardium. This is before contrast. You see that the thrombus into the pericardium and after contrast diffusion, you see that the small bubbles circulate into the pericardium. Concerning uh, stress contrast echo studies, uh, the use of contrast enhanced agents help us in acquisition of loops, avoiding for shortening, and of course, at the peak of the stress uh, protocols, it's like a beacon to help us to drive or pick the images up. This is an example. This is a three-chamber view of, uh, of our uh, patient uh, doing the stress echo 
at a low level, uh, uh, 5 to 10 microton per kilogram per minute, and you see that the uh, myocardium is getting hyperdynamic, except for that small uh, segment, the uh, apical anterior interoceptor, interventricular septum uh, segment, that uh, it was infected, and you see that it's a kinetic. And furthermore, you see that the, how the fibrosis extended into the, uh, into the uh, myocardium. This is um, a new, uh, a, a new access uh, uh, or a, a new way, a model way to evaluate the extension of uh, myocardial, uh, myocardial infarction or fibrosis into uh, the myocardium besides the MRI. So, contrast enhanced SECO is not only a multiparametric echo technique, it's a multiparametric technique offers diagnostic and prognostic information, evaluating agina, ECG changes, exercise tolerance, wall motion abnormalities, perfusion abnormalities, as we know that the perfusion abnormality is one of the first steps of the ischemic cascade, but of course arrhythmias, non sustained VT or sustained VT. According um, to the recent recommendation, again, multiple studies have demonstrated the ability of ultrasound contrast agents to improve study quality and increase reader confidence. It's very important in study interpretation. Very low MI techniques, that means MI less than 0 0.2, and the possibility of assessment of myocardial perfusion to the high quality assessment of regional and global uh, LV wall motion. This is an old randomized crossover study evaluated the use of contrast uh, echo uh, during the butamistral echo. As you see, at the peak of stress, 97% of the cases uh, after contrast diffusion were uh, well visualized, compared to 67% uh, of the cases without contrast. These gives our uh, high confidence and uh, of course translates to high sensitivity and high specific, uh, specificity of the obitimus stress echo just evaluated gold motion abnormalities. Our lab is a busy uh, lab. We do every day a lot of uh, stress echo uh, studies using uh, different protocols and uh, different stressors. Uh, we, uh, we used a bicycle test, the butamine stress echo is the most familiar, and of course we have experience on three generations of adenosinergic stress, like tibiridamol, adenosine, or agatenosine, which is um, uh, 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 A2, a selected A2 uh, receptor agonist, and has minor uh, adverse effects. Events. So it's very safe and it's very uh, easy to use. Of course, contrast enhanced agents infused as a repetitive bolus of 0.3 ml or continuous infusion 0.8 ml per minute, particularly for uh, adenosinergic stress protocols. So we have an uh, experience uh, almost 20 years from 1999 to 2017. And you see that the last years we uh, performed more than 2,000 studies, stress echo studies. We use contrast in every, uh, in every case. Uh, we know uh, also that the uh, 2017 FDA black box uh, was published that the use of contrast agents uh, declined significantly, significantly. But after that, the next year, we published uh, a large safety uh, study using myocardial flash echocardiography in more than 5,000 cases. And we believe really that the uh, contrast agents are the safety agents among the other cardiovascular imaging agents. And of course, uh, we published data on a diagnostic of 2D and uh, work, uh, we uh, work, uh, the last year, the last five years worked on 3D also, and prognostic data because we believe that uh, the butamine stress cardiography has a powerful impact. So we use real-time flash echocardiography. This is the uh, image, the frame before flash. We use high mechanical lytics 0.81. And after flash, one second post-flash, you see there is, that there is a perfusion effect at the apex, which is consistent uh, with LAD disease. Uh, 
normally at the rest uh, uh, at rest studies uh, the myocardium uh, replenishes uh, at the first uh, five seconds uh, during uh, the stress acostatis, the, the normal myocardial replenishes at two seconds. So this is a case, an old case, 2005, in the era of thrombolysis. Patients with STEMI in ICU 24 hours after thrombolysis. We, uh, we give um, a bolus injection for 0.4 ml. And you see that there is, a, after flash, that there is a, a perfusion defect at the apex. And of course, there is a tiny apical thrombus over there. Another old study, this is a dobutamine stress echo study in a man uh, with uh, two uh, risk factors with a general exertion of the last mass. And you see that the uh, apex is getting crowded, dilating, and you see the black line uh, that means perfusion defect. Uh, this is a long uh, loop including uh, four and two chamber view. And all this data consistent with severe mid-LAD disease. More recent studies uh, of a patient with three risk factors and stable agenda, and you can notice that the mid and the basal part of the lateral wall are, are getting hypokinetic, and of course there is a myocardial perfusion. Another more complicated case 84 years old man with a permanent pacemaker. Uh, the, our patient was a pacemaker dependent. And you see during the beauty, Mr. Seco, that the apex is um, a synergic, but we uh, adequate perfusion. But you can notice that the lateral wall and the basal segment of the reticular septum uh, are getting hypokinetic and with perfusion defect. That's that consistent with posterior circulation um, ischemic response. So let's move to the role of contrast enhanced Terseco in different clinical scenarios. Evaluated the patient with acute chest pain, no ECG changes, and negative troponin. Evaluated patients with stable angina, and evaluated micro, uh, micro viability patients. Uh, this slide um, demonstrated wonderful uh, two papers uh, by senior Oxy, uh, focused on the incremental diagnostic prognostic value of contemporary stress echo, echo in a chest pain unit. And uh, uh, you see that the uh, patients with ischemic response had the early at late uh, worse uh, outcome. And of course, for the patients who are admitted to the chest pain unit, we uh, can, uh, we can um, uh, reclassify uh, high as high, intermediate, or low risk. And you see, according to this paper, 72 of the patients were uh, intermediate, characterized as intermediate risk. And after stress echo, you see that this, uh, uh, this percentage went down to 3%. Most of uh, this group reclassified as low uh, risk, uh, as low risk, so the patients uh, discharged the next day and of course had a wonderful outcome. So uh, we have to be careful because of the next, uh, the next slide we have to uh, vote. A 60-year-old man with chest pain, no ECG changes, and troponin borderline. We performed the denosine uh, protocol with uh, contrast infusion, and you see real-time imaging, four, two, and three chamber view. How the you have to notice how uh, the myocardium replenishes after flash. Again, the same uh, images, four, two, and three uh, views using triggering images. Using uh, this uh, imaging, we get end systolic uh, frames, and you see easier how the myocardium replenishes. So uh, the question is, uh, we, uh, uh, one, normal wall motion, normal perfusion. Two, abnormal wall motion, abnormal perfusion in LAD territory. Three, wall motion, abnormal perfusion in LAD ter territory. And four, abnormal wall motion, abnormal perfusion in posterior circulation. Please vote. So <clears throat> while the colleagues are voting, um, 
maybe not any one of our viewers is uh, familiar uh, uh, with the diagnostic criteria for a perfusion defect. Maybe you can summarize it briefly. What is, uh, what is a typical yeah. sign of a perfusion defect? Yeah. After counter effusion, you see that the, a, sub, a, a black line at the, at the, the subendocardium. Mm -hmm. And also you see that the ischemic, uh, uh, the segments with ischemic response uh, replenishes uh, later, uh, later than four, seg uh, four seconds. Yeah. So this is a sign of ischemic response using myocardial perfusion. Mm. And uh, I think uh, it is important to look at contiguous ward segments, so yeah, uh, not only to look in one uh, view, epical view. So uh, we have gotten the results. 65% um, uh, of our viewers vote for abnormal wall motion and abnormal perfusion in the LAD territory. Yeah. Do you agree? Uh, I think that uh, uh, we're quite an very, experienced, very experienced uh, audience. Uh, audience. So yes. the patients underwent coronary geography, you see that the LAD is blocked at the fields by RCA. So um, move to uh, uh, two papers, a diagnostic value for of adenosine stress echo for in hypertension patients with mild to moderate uh, hypertrophy, and you see that the uh, dobutamine stress contrast echo has high sensitivity for uh, all uh, three uh, coronary territories, and you see that the lateral wall there is a defect. In this case, uh, there is a perfusion defect at the apex. This uh, paper has a high clinical uh, output, and you, uh, we deal uh, with uh, patients with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation with uh, transient ST uh, segment uh, depression. At, according to our results, 30% of these uh, patients had coronary artery disease. In this uh, paper, we um, uh, compare treadmill test, uh, thallium uh, scintigraphy, and of course, the butamine stress echo. You see that the uh, uh, dobutamine stress contrast echo has higher diagnostic, the highest uh, diagnostic uh, accuracy. And you see uh, two uh, loops of a uh, diabetic patient with dyspnea and exertion. And we, uh, uh, this patient uh, uh, underwent uh, dobutamine stress echo. At the fourth stage of uh, dobutamine, the patient presented uh, a dyspnea. And this is for chamber view using LVO with mechanical index 0 0.3. And this just put the, just push uh, another uh, button, you see the perfusion. And uh, please vote which is the correct answer. Wall motion, normal wall motion perfusion, abnormal wall motion perfusion, restricted to the apex, extended ischemic response, abnormal wall motion, abnormal perfusion in a lady territory, or for dyspnea due to microvascular disease. Please vote. Uh, um. <clears throat> there are a few questions from your, the audience uh, about renal function and contrast. And in this patient with the diabetes, we have uh, very often the problem of uh, reduced yeah. renal function yeah. in diabetic patients. Um, is there any concern about no. renal function? No concern about, about renal function. Yes, even uh, in dialysis, uh, yeah, yeah. no problem. No, no, no problem. No we problem. have a, a okay. great experience of this paper. So, so uh, we have gotten the answers. Uh, Fifty-five per, uh, per percent um, voted for extended ischemia response, abnormal wall motion, and abnormal perfusion in the LED territory. Oh, yeah. This you is agree? The, yeah. You see the perfusion okay. defect at uh, the apical uh, segment of interverticular septum. Apex goes down to the lateral wall. So, I need your help. Uh, a 57 year old man with known moderate to severe aortic regurgitation at mild aortic stenosis due to bicuspid aortic valve. The patient had a dilated ascetic aorta, 5.6 centimeter. And of course, uh, uh, the patient admitted to our uh, department, uh, to our hospital, due to dyspnea on exertion. Ten days before his admission to our hospital, the patient that had a geography, RCA was normal. But you see the lady, we can see that there, is, uh, there are uh, uh, two consecutive uh, lesions, 50% at the proximal, at the 60% at the mid part. 
and we uh, we have to uh, we have to answer to the surgeon. Uh, should the surgeon revascular, uh, revascularize this LED? So uh, we did a, a regretenoson infusion uh, just to, to see CFR at perfusion in this patient. And you see high diastolic velocities at rest in LED 1.2. And you see how the velocities, diastolic velocities um, uh, getting uh, high, 2.4. 2.4 meter per second, and CFR was two. So we uh, do uh, we did uh, simultaneously perfusion, and you see the four and three chamber view. P so please vote which is the correct answer: CFR two consistent with hemodynamically borderline severe LED stenosis, even in a patient with moderate or severe AR. My card, the perfusion is an accurate method for evaluation LED, and FFR should be added. IVUS is the best modality for evaluation of LED lesions. So please vote. So um, you asked uh, in this question, uh, should we use a functional additional test? Yes. Yeah, I think um, that. We need the functional addition test. Exactly. And uh, you, you perform flow reserve measurement on a, uh, in a lots of your stress tests? Or only yeah, the, la the last years we have a, a, an experience on a CFR. Yeah. But we try to do yeah. more and, and more to extend. And what is your experience? It is, it is worse to, to learn the technique or uh, it is too difficult? What is your no, experience? No, it's not uh, so difficult for LED. Yeah, but okay. it's more difficult yeah, for I the agree. other. So. Uh, we have done uh, lots of studies in our Ecolab, and I think it's uh, really uh, feasible in a clinical routine in the LED. Mm -hmm. So we have the result. 64% uh, voted for myocardial perfusion. Uh, answer two. Okay. Uh, and I think uh, yeah. you it's agree? Right. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And we need an additional test. Well, yeah, we went... We, do, we did also FFR, which is uh, 0 0.78, uh, so we, we answer to the surgeon. So, we move to uh, the last part, myocardial viability. In a modern er era, you see that we have to evaluate myocardial thickness, myocardial thickness of the myocardium, and myocardial perfusion all together. As you see, this patient have, has very thin uh, apex, less than five millimeter. The thickness is absent, but of course, no myocardial perfusion. This, in this case, we have no uh, myocardial variability at the absent, at the apex. And from pathophysiological uh, point of view, another case, you see. Uh, uh, two days after primary PTCA on a mid LED, uh, two D loops and three D loops, and you see that uh, there is um, a, a, a perfusion defects at the apex, uh, apical lateral and apical anterior wall that consists non flow phenomenon. Three uh, D loops, you see that the uh, simultaneously uh, we uh, we demonstrate uh, uh, four and two, uh, two chamber view, and you see that the, there is a defect at the apex. So both 2D and 3D loops agree. I skip this, and I will, I will present uh, the uh, uh, two papers of our, uh, with <coughs> our prognostic data uh, of uh, Mr. Seco. At, uh, the most powerful uh, impact of uh, Mr. Seco is at the middle age. And of course, uh, concerning uh, um, diabetic patients, if there is an appropriate indication, the, um, uh, the outcome of this, uh, that we have a positive uh, stress echo, the outcome of this uh, group of patients is worse. So we have realized that the, there is a shift from reports of, on each diagnostic accuracy toward risk certification. To, so take home messages, dear colleagues, uh, myocardial thickness abnormality during stress echo is better appreciated using contrast enhanced agents. Wall thickness abnormalities are better appreciated when concomitant subedocardial perfusion defect is observed. Uh, 
The incremental progress to value of the contest enhanced echo is crucial in clinical practice for each patient, independently of age, from children to octogenarians. We can tailor a dedicated contest enhanced echo protocol with a specific method to address a particular diagnostic question. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you. Um, we have maybe time for one or two questions. Um, there is a question about contrast uh, during myocardial infarction and strain. Uh, do you see, uh, how do you believe you to use both well, methods in the clinical it, routine? In, uh, in ICU, you use uh, in more than 80% of uh, infected patients a uh, contrast edges just to, uh, to mm. see better the wall motion abnormalities, but of course, uh, to detect thrombus. Mm, okay, this because is, uh, this is very point. crucial. Yeah, uh, it is difficult to detect a tr thrombus yeah. with yeah. strain imaging. Yeah. Maybe yeah. the thrombus is tracked by speckle yeah. tracking, and there oh. is a false result. Um, I think uh, um, if there is a very good imaging quality, strain is has a value. Yeah, of but, course. But uh, very often, uh, when there is a bad acoustic window, you can't but, use uh, strain, yeah. so uh, you it's have only the difficult. chance to use contrast. Yeah. Uh, is there any safety concern, contrast after STEMI when, five or seven days or less, is one question of the uh, news? No, 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 no uh, safety concern. I have to present that uh, 2007, when the FDA black, uh, black box uh, was um, uh, demonstrated, it was published. We have already uh, 80, uh, 80 uh, patients with contrast before and after, um, after uh, perfusion therapy. Mm. So we noticed no uh, adverse events. I'd just like to interrupt there. And, um, we talked about strain and then um, giving contrast. And there's been a couple of papers recently one of the papers uh, uh, published by the group of Roxy Senior as well, where you can actually, after giving contrast, you can also do strain imaging. So, you know, it's the first, after you've given your flash, you destroy the, uh, the bubbles, and then the first frame after that, uh, which gives you also no. actual good delineation of the myocardium, and you can do strain yeah. imaging there mm. as well. Good point. So, um, I think we're actually now approaching the end of the webinar. I would like to close this session by highlighting the key messages of this webinar. Ultrasound contrast agents are safe. Uh, the risk of severe anaphylaxis is low and comparable to MRI contrast agents, whereas geodine contrast agents in the CAS lab show about a tenfold higher risk of severe anaphylactic reactions than ultrasound contrast agents. Use contrast enhanced echocardiography when two or more contiguous wall segments are not adequately visualized on con non-contrast echocardiography and management of the patient will depend on whether there are regional wall motion abnormalities or not. This is a class one level A indication according to our new recommendations of the CVI in October 2017. Knowledge and training is needed to optimize contrast-enhanced images and to minimize imaging artifacts and best results will be obtained by using a contrast-specific imaging modality consisting of a low mechanical index below 0.2 and in combination with a tissue signal cancellation technique like pulse inversion or power modulation. This is a class 1 level B recommendation and with this uh, combined technique not only wall motion, but also perfusion can be assessed at rest and during stress tests. And we have seen several examples for this during this webinar. And uh, inter-reader agreement is improved comparable to MRI studies. So uh, we will now close this webinar. Thank you to Professor Shivakya and to Assistant Professor Ageli uh, for the excellent presentations. And finally, thanks to Braco Imaging who supported this webinar with an educational grant. We hope you enjoyed this time with us. You will be able to view this webinar offline in a few days on the ESC website. Thank you.